Um, we've been in a series called uh, God's Amazing Church, but we've been looking at different facets of the church. I've, I've said that this is not an all-encompassing series on, on the church. There are a lot of things that um, we're not going to talk about, but we obviously will in the future. We'll always have a subject to talk about when we talk about God's bride, God's family, uh, who we are as we are on earth. We will be together in heaven. Uh, we were talking before the service, and uh, someone said uh, they'd like to be 35 again. I said, no, I'm a whole lot closer to home at 60. So um, I don't know if I want to. I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, being with my Lord and my Savior and my Master and my, my Father and my God. So uh, I'm just uh, on service for the Lord here, just as you are. And what a wonderful thing it is to be a part of God's amazing church, God's church that is triumphant no matter what. But we mentioned a few things, and we, the first thing we said was the church should be a welcoming church, a, a welcoming church. This should be the closest to heaven, this side of glory. When God's people come together, when we are with each other, when, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us, there is, there is a, the, the word literally is charisma. It is the very essence of the Holy Spirit with us, living in us. This should be the closest that we ever get to heaven. And the world needs to know that. This side of glory, this is the closest as we're going to get. That Not only should we just say that, but we should believe this and, and, and we should practice it. And the, it needs to be evident to the world. When the, when the world thinks of New Holland Baptist Church, they need to say that is a welcoming church I am always welcomed by the love of God there. Amen? Then we talked about being a gathering church. Hebrews 10, I might dribble down my shirt there. Hebrews 10, 25 says, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. That word forsake means exactly what you think. To, to leave, just leave them behind. I'm, I'm not going to stand up, I'm going to forsake it. We are not to forsake assembling of ourselves together as is the practice or really the habit of some. And you can get in a habit of not going to church. You can get in a habit of not reading your Bible. You can get in a habit of not being with a different group of, a, a group of people that, that you can uh, be discipled by and help disciple others. You can get in that habit, and that's not a good thing. I don't know how much time we have here on earth, but we need to be about the Lord's business while we're here. And we need to understand that we are important. As a matter of fact, Christ thinks, Christ knows the church is vital to his mission and to our betterment. So we need to uh, do missions together. We need to celebrate together. We need to worship together. We need to fellowship together. We need to disciple together. That's who we are as a church. We are better together. Then we also said that we are a together church, one heart and one accord. That's the description. And by the way, that's not my heart. That's not your heart. That's the Lord's heart. We come together with him. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. So we come together in the bonds of Christ's love. Now, we may be different, right? Just look around at us. Are we different? different places that we come from, different things that we do, different things that we hold highly, but we're same in the eyes of God. So if we are the same in the eyes of God and God loves us all together, we are called to live in unity with each other. Satan's number one attack is to attack the unity of God's people, the togetherness of God's people. Don't let it happen. And then we are a serving church, a serving church. The church has been so very, very good to me. The things that I have been taught in my life that I take for granted, the things that are the part of the fiber of who I am and how I think and what I believe, that, that has been brought to me. And I think about the people that, that have invested in my life. I think about a Sunday school teacher by the name of Barbara Welch. I promise you, this side of glory, she did not know how much of a blessing she was to me. But she saw something within me. And she made me feel 10 foot tall. 
And she taught me all the things that God had done for me, and I'm so very grateful for that. Another person who has no idea of all the things that they did for me was a man by the name of Kimbrell King. Now, that's a name, isn't it? Kimbrell King, but he was my RA director. And he saw me for not being my, my, my parents' child, but he saw me for being me and who God made me and the possibilities of me. And Leon Talent, who always... Um, was such a blessing to me and always pushed me to do more and always saw something within me and, and uh, demanded a lot of me. And I'm so very grateful for that. See, because we learn by doing. We don't learn to serve God by watching others serve God. We learn to serve God by doing it. I was taught that and I was given an opportunity. I was actually pushed to do that. And uh, it wasn't always e easy, but I learned. I was being mentored and didn't even know it. I was being discipled. And I believe we've got to give back. I do. I'm 60 now. And really, I've been a Christian for 50 years, and, and people have been poured into my life my whole life. And I understand that there's another group of people that needs that exact same thing. If you are like I am, if you've got that testimony of people who loved you, who, who gave you opportunities to, to walk with God together and to serve, then we need to understand it's our privilege to do it forward, to do for others what was done for us, to, to help disciple and bring this to others. The church has been mighty to me in my 60 years, but I've seen a lot of changes in the church. And change is just a normal part of life. Some people don't like change, but everything that is alive changes. And everything that grows changes. And what we want to do is be alive for God and bloom for God in the season that God's allowed us to live in. But the message hasn't changed. We have the same Savior. We have the same God. We have the same Spirit encouraging us on. And on that solid rock, we're going to stand. As, all, as long as I am your pastor, we're going to hold these truths close to our heart. We're not going to let anybody dilute them or walk them down. I don't care what the world says. We're not following the Word. We're following our Lord and our Savior. Preaching may change, styles may change, but the Word of God will remain forever. And the world has changed, hasn't it? I was thinking back in the 1920s, they called it the Roaring Twenties. I think if they had a name for 2020s, this decade, they might call it the Raging Twenties. Seems like there's a lot of things going on in our culture there's more unrest than I could ever imagine. There's less patience, less tolerance, especially for anyone that doesn't agree with you. They're always coming. They're always trying to push us down. And how does the church remain constant in the love of God without any dissonance in a culture that is lacking in unity. How can we remain united when the world around us is anything but united? We have a God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we have the same, listen to me now, the same Holy Spirit abides in every Christian. There is no difference there. There is not a little bit of spirit in one and a different kind of spirit in another. There may be different gifts that God's given us, but one spirit that leads us to the Father. But we need to be aware of what God is doing. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, in speaking of the children of Jacob, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Jacob, man, the grace of God, the, the mercy of God in somebody. His name meant schemer. 
But God never gave up on him. He was a liar and a cheat. But God saw something wonderful in him. As a matter of fact, before he was born, God predestined that he would be the one that God would use and not his older brother. God allowed his older brother to be born first, but God had a plan for Jacob too. And after spending a night wrestling with God, God changed his name and called him Israel, which means this, God prevails. In the midst of a a hard time, when God was doing a movement among his people, he used a schemer, a liar, and a cheat, and God poured his spirit within him and said, no longer are you that person, you're now a new person, a new creation. Does that not sound like salvation? And the word for you is, God prevails. New Holland, I don't care what the world says. As long as God is on the throne, we, his people, we have a God who will prevail. But of these 12 tribes, one of his children was named Issachar. Listen to this verse when it speaks about Issachar. The sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Did you hear that? This was God's gift for them so that they could know the times, be aware of what was going on in the world, and know what God was going to do among his people in the world. You know what that says to me? That says to me that this is highly important. It is needed. And it's something God provided. But the secret is not just learning from yesterday. A lot of people are students of yesterday. And I understand that we need to learn from yesterday so that we don't make the same mistakes in the future. But we need to be very aware of today. Being nostalgic is not going to help us. God only meets us in the right now. Church, God is in the eternal. He may have invented time that we can walk in so that we can have a choice to choose to serve him. But we need to understand that there are things that are going on and God wants to be working today. You can only meet God in the right now. You can't change yesterday and you can't get to tomorrow till he gets here. You can only meet God in the right now. And the church must focus not on yesterday and not worry about heaven and that's that God's got that. But our mission, our job is to be relevant with God the active working of the Holy Spirit today. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul gives this admonition, admonition to the church at Ephesus. Redeeming the time, come on now, for the days are evil. They were evil then, and it looks like they're evil today. And it says in that admonition, that our responsibility is to be redeeming the time. In Colossians, in chapter number 5, verse number 16, oh, excuse me, Colossians chapter 4, verse number 5, it says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. He says, church, God wants to do a work in the today. And we need the wisdom of God to know how we are to walk in the world today. The world is evil, no doubt about it. And we need the wisdom of God to know how to deal with those people who do not know Christ, who are facing an eternity without knowing Christ. 
We need the wisdom of God to know how to act and react, how to love and be kind and tolerant in an intolerant world. We need to join God who is actively at work to make an impact on them. The word there is redeeming. Redeeming the time. Strong's exhaustive concordance in Thayer's lexicon says this about the word redeeming. It is a verb that means it is an action word. It means it's something we are to be doing. Doing. Not just believing, but doing. It means two things. Number one, by payment of a price to recover from the power of another. To ransom. For instance, if someone were taken hostage and they, were, they, they had a price uh, uh, that they were holding out, someone had to pay that price so that that person could be brought back. That's exactly what redemption or the ransom of what Christ did for us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Only one could pay the price. Jesus paid the price with his blood on the cross of Calvary to buy us back from our sin, to set us free, to walk in newness of life today and forever with him. We have been ransomed. We have been redeemed. But it also means this, and I'm going to have to read this twice but I, 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 I'm, this is not Brian's words. This is God's word explained. It means this, to make wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good. To make wise and sacred. I love that. This is, this is when we're obedient to God. This is sacred time. This is a verb, sacred activity, to make wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good so that zeal and will will set forth in the pur as purchase money by which we make this time our own. So we're going to be wise. We're going to take this advantage of this opportunity so that we can purchase those that are outside, be a part of God's redemption, so we can take this time and make it our own. That's why he says redeeming the time. We've got to be redeeming the time right now. We can't wait. We've got to be relevant to this time. Relevant to this time. Look, I, I, you might think I'm hung up on this word, opportunity. It's that nautical term, opportuna, which means to set your sails in such a way so that when the wind blows against your sails, it'll take you to the desired destination. We can't make the wind blow. Only the Lord can do that. But it's our job to set our sails so that when God so chooses to blow, we're ready for him to take us to the desired destination. We need <clears throat> the sons of Issachar today. But y'all, I hope you're listening to me. I know, I'll tell you one thing for certain. That's not me. I'm not saying I'm the sons of Issachar. I, I, I wish I was, but it is a fact that there, these things are, are real and relevant, relevant in our world, but uh, we need to know them, uh, but that's not me. But I will, I, I will make you a promise. I have done everything that I know to do. I have read, I have studied, I have asked, I have listened. I have done everything that I know to do to learn what God is seeking to do in this world today, as I know many of you have. COVID changed things for us. I never would have thought that there would be a time that we would have closed the doors of the church. <clears throat> but we had to shut down. And when COVID came, I was the eager beaver. I wanted to get back as soon as possible. And they kept saying, we can't do it yet, we can't do it yet. But the first opportunity that we did, we did. 
And it's been about two years and a month ago when we started meeting together again. And it was, we understood that when we first came back together, not very many people came. So we invested in the new video that we were doing, and we invested in the audio that goes with that video to try to make it a better experience for those that were at home. And I would dare say that just about all of you experienced that at some point in time. <clears throat> we have gotten back to, we're not back to COVID numbers, but just to add this into you, we're averaging per week, I think in May we averaged 120 something that came to the building. But this year, not just last month, this year we're averaging close to 50 people that are watching us live streaming online. Plus, ones that watch us during the week that may be working on Sundays and they come back and watch us during the week. We have a YouTube channel. Did y'all know that? You can subscribe to our YouTube channel if you so like to. We're not selling advertisements on it. Um, but we, we have it where you can go to our website, newhollandbc.org, and you can watch any of our services anytime that you want to. You can watch the Sunday morning services. You can watch the Wednesday night, Wednesday night services. We've got them all there available. If you actually look at the numbers that we have that are meeting in the building, plus those that are watching us online, we're surpassing what we were doing pre-COVID. I don't know that you catch that. Sometimes because we don't see them, we don't think that they're here. And let me give you one more caveat to that. When I say that there's almost 50 watching, I don't know how many people are watching. That's almost 50 units. They could be watching on a smart TV, on a laptop, on a computer, uh, on an iPad, on their phone. It could be one person watching. If it is just only one person watching, then that's close to 50 people. If it's some or two people watching on a smart TV or something like that, as I know some do, then it could be 60 or 70. I don't know. But I'm just here to tell you, church is changing a little bit. And everybody says, well, yeah, but that's a different experience. You're absolutely right. It is a different experience. Well, it'd be better if they came here. I'll agree with you there too. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. But I'm telling you, we have to minister where we are. We can't wait for them to come and do what we think they should do. We minister to them where they are and pray that God will lead them from where they are to where that he wants them to be. Can I get an amen? When COVID hit, we went to two services. We tried to um, stay clean and clean in between services. And I give a shout out to Gary and Cheryl and Steve back there who did it just about every week. Others uh, Clinton and Broadus and others joined in sometimes and, and cleaned as well. We quit doing Sunday night service because uh, we were told that COVID could only live three days. Folks, we were just learning as we went. At one time, we weren't doing midweek services, and then we started doing midweek services again. During this time, we've always tried. I've, I've done my best. I don't know that y'all are going to believe me here, but I, I, I have done my best to keep my finger on the pulse of New Holland. It wasn't too long ago. I did a, I guess you would call it a poll. We had a deacon's meeting and we were talking about this and I polled the group that was in the room. Only one said that we wanted to go back to one service. All the rest of them said we wanted to stay in two services for that point in time. When this spring came about, I, obviously I'm not the sons of Issachar, but I want to be aware and I want to listen, Right? And by the way, if you ask a question, you better be ready for the answer. Amen? Uh, it's not like I, I'm going to put out a survey there and then I'm just going to ignore it and wad it up and throw it in the trash can and say, oh, I'm great. I'm glad to know how they feel. Now we're going to do what I want. That ain't, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. So we did a survey. And I sent out a survey to um, every family. We did it by mail. By the way, I didn't know the greatest way of doing it, so we just did what we could. 
and we sent the survey. If I knew that there was a husband and wife that were um, both church members, I would send out two surveys in the envelope. And I put a, a self-addressed stamped envelope there so you could just fill out the survey. All you had to do was put it in. And I was kind of hoping that I would get two surveys back or if there was a family that had three or four, we'd get three or four back. Didn't happen that way. Um, I guess uh, from what I'm hearing, most of y'all talked about it together, and, and we got one survey just about back for every one. By the way, there wasn't a name on there, so the only ones I knew the name of uh, are the ones who signed it, which is less than a handful, maybe a handful. It's either four or five. I can't remember exactly. We got 74 surveys back. We've been averaging 120, plus the ones that are watching online. I think that's a pretty good number. Have y'all heard these polls that they're doing on TV, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, all those, they do those polls, Gallup and all the Politico and all those, they'll do those polls. And they'll poll 2,000 people. And they expect like, they, this is what the world thinks because we talked to 2,000 people. Well, I'm not sure the wisdom of that. But I think it, for the numbers that we got back, I was extremely well pleased. And this is kind of what we came up with. I, I got most of the, the surveys back mid-April. Um, I, I talked to Broadus as our chairman of the deacons, and I said, uh, Broadus, we need to meet together and talk about these. And he said, well, let's just meet with them in our deacons meeting on May 1st. I said, okay. We actually got uh, surveys, more surveys up till May 1st, and actually got more surveys uh, the week of, the first week of May. So they just kind of kept uh, trickling in. And I asked a question of you. I said, would you like to have two services where we could have one service that's more um, hymns, more um, uh Mark uses the word balanced, I amen his word. Um, have one that's more balanced, the first service. And would you like to have two services where the second service could be more contemporary? By the way, somebody said on, on their survey, they said, I never knew we did contemporary. And I'm like, well, we haven't. We've done some of the modern music that's out there. But uh, we haven't always done contemporary. And by the way, we're, as long as I'm pastor here, uh, I think everybody's in agreement. We're not going to bring up the fog stuff, you know. Amen. I'm not going to have the smoke of the Holy Spirit just uh, encompassing me when I preach and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not going to get a Ferrari in here and use it for a backdrop. And I know churches are doing all these different things. That's as close as I'd ever get to a Ferrari. Amen. But I, I'm not going to do that. And other churches can do whatever they so choose to do. But I'm, a, uh, I'm just a product of who God made me. But uh, we know that we do need to reach a different generation. And everybody has said to me, we need more younger people. They're not going to just come because you want them to. They have to feel welcome. They have to feel like they have a place. And they have to feel like they have an opportunity to be a part. And we're going to have to, it's going to take effort. By the way, everything that we do in Mission for God takes effort. If you're just sitting back, coasting, I'm not sure that's your best effort for Christ. But we took the, we said, would you like to have a service that has both, or would you like to have one service where we just do it like we had done it the, the two years, the three years that I've been here? And uh, the survey came back two to one, literally two to one, to have two services. Now, there were four that we excluded because they voted for both. I can't do two services and one service at the same time. I can do one service at a time, but there's no way I can do both, so we excluded those. But other than that, it was dead on the number two to one for two services. We also asked a question, what do you think about Sunday night? 
Would you like to do Sunday night like we were doing before? Or we, I, I listed some other things. Would you like to do some of these things? Or would you just like to have the Sunday morning service and spend time with your family? That's how I worded it. I'll read it to you. I, got my, I brought it with me. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on Sunday evening? Another singing and preaching service? Discipleship groups, prayer ministry, service ministry, or I enjoy morning service and using the evening for family time. This was more of a blowout. It was 78% wanted just Sunday morning. I actually asked a caveat question. I said, if you would like a Sunday evening service, would you faithfully attend? Of those who voted for a Sunday evening service, only half of those said they would faithfully attend. Uh, some said that they would come some, and uh, some people would write in the margins, y'all know who you were, you write in the margins and you said, um, if I can, I'll do the best I can. And I said, okay. So we said that the, what, what the voice of the church was was to have two services and to have no Sunday evening service. Now, <clears throat> I like win-wins. I'll be honest with you. I don't like win-lose, do you? Where one group gets their way and another group doesn't. And I think that if we can be listening to the Holy Spirit, we can have win-wins. As a matter of fact, I think everything... Hold on, I, don't, I, I, I think I may have just lost you. Please give me five minutes. I pray that everything that we do would be for a purpose. And if God is speaking through his people, there is something he wants to do. And our responsibility, our privilege is to take advantage of that and run with it and do the best for the glory of God where everybody can become a winner. That's why we're going to do more hymns in the early service. If you like hymns, come to the early service. If we can do something that can be more attractive to the younger, you know, there's always going to be dissonance from one generation to the next. There's going to be misunderstandings. There's going to be one group that looks at them and says, I don't understand them. Why can't they be more like us? And the younger groups are like, I don't want to be a part of them. Why can't they be more like us and let us do our thing? There is something called the five love languages. Y'all know, if, how many of y'all have heard of the five love languages? Uh, Gary Chapman did a fantastic job. I, I do marriage counseling before I marry any couple. I make them go through the love languages. I've taught it many times. It's amazing to me, but there's something that I've learned from the love languages. There are five love languages, uh, touch, uh, words of affirmation, gifts, quality time, and um, acts of service. Did I save all five? All right, I went blank there for a second, but I got all five of them. Now, the, what the love languages are is that's a way that you process love. You process love by someone sharing words of affirmation or spending quality time with you or acts of service doing something with you. But I, it's not only how you receive love, it's how you share love. And we're different. My... Uh, love language is touch. My wife's love language is um, acts of service. So I can go around telling her all the time, baby, you look beautiful. Ah, I just love you so much. You're so great. You're so wonderful. And I'm, I'm, she's like, okay, what do you want? You know, right? But, but she may not be feeling it. But if, if I wash the dishes, y'all heard me say if. Right, but if I'm doing something that's uh, that's serving her and the family, she thinks I'm the greatest thing that ever came around. Here's to what I learned from the five love languages. We're all four hours. It's natural to us, and we expect others to respond accordingly. The trouble I've had with couples is where they were good with theirs. And they didn't understand why the other people could not join them. And the problem is, is that if you're waiting for everybody else to join you, in church, 
If you're waiting for, you've got an ideal in your mind of the ideal church or the ideal Christian, and if you're waiting for everybody else to join that, you may be by yourself or with a small group of people who are like-minded, the homogeneous unit. One of the traits of a healthy church is not being nostalgic. If you're just waiting for this to be 1950 again, that day has come and gone, and God loves you, but God wants to be real and relevant to you in 2022. And I'm not saying we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen? There's a lot of things that we learn from and we keep and we hold most precious to us. But the clock's never going to go backward. So what we're going to do for a win-win is we're going to come together. We're going to serve together. We're going to assembly together. Right? We're going to be the welcoming church that I know you want to be. We're going to do every opportunity. We're going to set our sails. We're going to, we're going to be proactive to do everything that we can so that every generation will be served. When the grandparents say, we need more younger people, then understand this. We've got to create every redeeming the time opportunity so that when they come, if they come, when we invite them, if they will allow us to have a place in their life, they can know the Lord that we know, they can love the Lord that we love, they can be embraced by Him, changed by Him, made new by Him, be given eternal life, and have an opportunity not just to reach their generation, but the next generation. We've got to pay it forward. It was done for me. It was done for you. Now we've got to decide, are we going to do it again? If we don't, what's the alternative? 